Barry Ritholz, the owner of a firm by your same name, a long time outspoken uh, Wall Street observer. Nice to see you here in the middle of a lake at Camp Kotak. Thanks for having me. We decided to give you a break from catching a whole bunch of fish just to catch this moment in time with you in terms of conversation. Yes. So let's start with the markets. Uh, we're bouncing around near all time highs. Some say valuations are stretched. At the same time, earnings could be better. What's your view on what's happening with markets right now? You know, historically, all-time highs are extremely bullish. Uh, we keep seeing people say, oh, markets are at highs, they have to give up. You look at how often you hit highs, it tends to beget additional highs. Um, the earnings situation is something else that I think a lot of people misread, misinterpret. Markets are rarely at fair value, except for brief periods when careening past to be either wildly overvalued or wildly undervalued. So markets are somewhat elevated in valuation, but they could stay that way for years and years at a time. And I don't know of anybody who's managed to make money. I don't know anyone who's managed to make money using PE as a sole basis for their investment decisions because you could buy sometimes when stocks are cheap doesn't mean they're not going to get cheaper and conversely you could buy stocks when they're a little pricey doesn't mean they're not going to get more expensive so you have to be really careful when you look at um, just a single variable like PE earnings have been pretty okay this quarter in fact we've been seeing more upside surprises than downside surprises given how badly beaten up the energy sector has become when 10% of the S&P 500 has their prime product cut in half and then some, hey, that's going to really put a hurt on earnings. That's probably about 40% of the weakness we've seen in earnings the past few quarters. There are some signs um, uh, of oil stabilizing here around $40. It's not anything I really worry about because it's somewhat of a zero-sum game. Oil's weakness tends to be consumer spending's gains. So what you give up in uh, S&P 500 earnings from the energy sector, you theoretically make up in consumer and retail spending a few quarters down the road. And now that we've had a solid year and change of fairly cheap gasoline, you're starting to see signs that the consumer is, is doing more than paying down debt and saving. They're actually going out and buying things. Look at how well uh, the auto market has been doing over the past couple of quarters. Uh, even with the occasional softness, the high profit trucks and SUVs and larger vehicles are doing really well. Do you think anything changes between now and the election? Does the market get on edge? Um, it's a really interesting question. Uh, look, nobody knows what the future holds. Historically, a rising market has tended to ben benefit the incumbent party. The assumption is the president controls the economy, the president controls the budget, and the president has a huge impact on uh, the stock market. And when you actually look at the data, that's a, a really uh, widespread misconception. Presidents get far too much credit for good economies. They get far too much blame for bad economies. The government is 25% of the economy. The private sector is 75%. You really need to see all the different sectors working well. So I don't want to say who the president is is irrelevant, but I could tell you that when we look at both George W. Bush and Barack Obama, one of my favorite slides in a presentation is George Bush proposes a trillion dollar tax cut and all my uh, Democratic friends talk about how terrible it is for the economy, for employment, for the market. Market proceeds to run up 94 percent over the next four years. Fast forward to March 2008 and all I hear is Barack Obama is a uh, Muslim Kenyan socialist. All my Republican friends this time are telling me how terrible he is for the markets and we see the market up 200 plus percent. So the mixing of politics and investing never is a good idea. People are always much better to keep the two separate. Investors should go into the voting booth, vote their conscience, um, but keep the politics out of their portfolios. But that's interesting to me because aren't we going to see fiscal policy coming out of D.C. that could really... Perhaps. Look, you've had a divided government. You've had a Democrat in the White House. You've had a Republican Congress. 
We haven't seen a whole lot of fiscal policy over the past six years. And even in the first two years, when Barack Obama had a slim majority in Congress, we got a very modest stimulus package, a third of which was extension of unemployment benefits and a third of which were temporary tax cuts. So $275, $300 billion. In the grand scheme of things, in a $16 trillion economy, that's not much of a stimulus. You know, the trillion dollar Bush tax cuts, that's a stimulus. Here it is 16 years later, whoever comes in, if you want to stimulate the economy, fix the roads and bridges, shore up the security of the ports, harden the electrical grid, there's a ton of things that could be done. Upgrade the airports, there's lots and lots of things that, that could be done. Uh, um, Historically, it has been the last cycle it was not. We'll see what happens. If we end up with a change of control in the Senate, and it's really unlikely to see that happen in the House, perhaps there might be a move back towards the older days of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, and some centric policies will get passed. There is a lot of interest in reforming the tax code. There is a lot of interest in reforming the business uh, tax side of things. There's a tremendous amount of interest in reducing regulation. There's a lot of interest in infrastructure. To me, that looks like a makings of a bipartisan deal. It's just a function of how cooperative everybody in D.C. decides, whether they're willing to put country first and get stuff done, or it's just going to be more of the same partisan gridlock. There's a reason why Congress has a lower approval rating than head lice. Even the Supreme Court, even... Barack Obama, widely disliked by the right, has a much higher approval rating than all of Congress. I think they're starting to realize that that's unsustainable and they have to change that. Either way, are stocks higher a year from now than where they are today? I haven't the slightest idea. Guess. Um, I think that when you look at the current situation where we are and you look at the potential problems in China, Who's, who seems to have a hard time getting out of that way. When we look at the ongoing issues with Greece and Italy, and we look at what's happening with the Brexit um, and what other EU countries might make have a vote, look at the political problems in Germany and Italy, uh, making a forecast as to markets a year from now is really a fool's errand. Markets will fluctuate, that's what we'll, they'll do. So many intervening events can change the direction of markets, not just the things I've out outlined, but things that we're just not even imagining. You have China sovereign policy in the South China Seas and a lot of rumblings with their neighbors. I don't know what, what happens with that. You have the never-ending backbeat um, background noise of terrorism, and, th and that actually is starting to influence um, how people feel and how they're behaving in Europe. You're potentially crimping, seeing the economy there get crimped by fears of terrorism. So guessing a year from now, all I'm willing to say is there are a lot of things that are going to affect the economy, going to affect politics, and going to affect corporate profits. And trying to guess 12 months out um, is a fool's errand. I will tell you the way we're invested is that we have a global asset allocation. We're primarily invested in low-cost indices. Rather than try and guess where the markets are, we don't think in terms of next month, next quarter, next year. We're looking out 10, 20 years from now. I think it's a, a, a little bit of an uh, easy answer to say, I expect 10 years from now markets will be higher. But even then, it's anybody's guess. We, we try and have a broad diversification so that no matter what happens around the world, some part of the portfolio is going to be working. Rather than guessing where are we in six months, who wins the election, what's GDP look like, we, we place our investments in terms of we think the world will be a better place one, five, and ten years from now, that technology continues to generate all sorts of interesting demand for consumer products, for economic activity, and that ultimately leads to stocks going higher. But I can't tell you if that's six months from now or six years from now. Well, at least you're not depressed about anything. What? Uh, look, you know, you, you can only worry about things that are within your control. Um, if I stress about what the ECB is going to do or who wins the election in the United States or what the price of oil is going to be, that's like worrying about whether it's going to rain. If it rains, I bring a raincoat. 
Uh, but I can't stop and especially amongst a group of economists where you hear every worry in the universe and how the whole world is going to hell. I've been coming up here for 10 years and I've been hearing some variation of that every single year. So sure, uh, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and don't try and guess what's unguessable. Barry Ritholtz, it's been great chatting with you on your way to catch I don't know how many fish. As, as long as the lines are tight and we keep casting, ca casting well, we'll do okay. <laughs> Thanks, Barry.